I really want to chat with you because I tried Quinn myself. I've like used the app before. Oh, yeah, uh -huh. and I was like, this is so cool. Absolutely. Thank you for having me and mm -hmm. congratulations on your pod. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And so, graduation and everything else. Thank you. Yeah. And you you went to Stanford too, right? I did, yeah. Yeah. I and didn't graduate. You didn't graduate. So you dropped out senior year. Is that what happened? Yeah. yeah. I want to talk about like the story a little bit of like what happened senior year and yeah. some discoveries that you had and like things like that. Absolutely, yeah. So um, you know how it is. I was at Stanford. I was mm -hmm. studying CS. I was um, studying systems in particular, and it was a very mm -hmm. um, male-dominated like track within CS, and it was it was just really hard. It was a lot of work. I loved it, but it was really hard. And at the same time, everyone's applying for jobs, right? Everyone's kind of looking for what's next. Um, and also at the same time, I had recently recovered from an eating disorder at that mm -hmm. time. And I was dealing with sexual dysfunction, which mm. at the time I wasn't fully aware of what that even meant. Yeah. Um, and I started kind of looking into it, looking into um, not only like drugs for sexual dysfunction, but also porn options and mm. sex education, all this whole area of content that I'd never explored. And I found audio erotica. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with it. It was the only thing I could find that really truly helped me overcome this sort of, some people call it anorgasmia or inability to orgasm, mm. inability to get wet, and just generally mm. feeling broken, right? A lot of women use that phrase of like, Ugh, why am I not working, right? right? Totally, totally. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that's that's the whole backstory. And then I dropped out in spring mm -hmm. and I moved to New York and started Quinn. Now we're three years in, things are finally starting to go well. That's awesome, <laughs> Knock that on takes wood. time, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but quite a journey. Totally, and and just like from your story and, and the, like finding out that you have like sexual dysfunction and mm -hmm. trying to go through all of that, like I, I saw online that there's like 30 different medications for men when it comes to sexual dysfunction, but for women, there aren't any. Is that like true? Um, That's and what correct. Was, what was your experience like going through trying to like get help from doctors or like, I don't know, how was that? Yeah, well, it's really interesting because women receive so many mixed messages around sex, like, mm -hmm. uh, and just around life. Like, I feel like at that time, right, I was feeling very empowered in some areas of my life. So like super empowered to go after a career and, you know, be a girl boss and whatnot. But then when I was like looking for help in this intimate part of my life, mm. I felt sort of deserted. Yeah. And there were all these options for men, right? Viagra and right. so forth and hymns and row and right. blah, blah, blah. You know Viagra is tax free. Really? I yeah. had no idea. I didn't know that at all. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah, that's there's amazing. no taxes on Viagra <laughs> and there's taxes on tampons. <laughs> Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, Trojan on TikTok, uh -huh. they post the most explicit, insane videos. Stop it. Like, and never get banned. Wow. Not one thing. And we, of wow. course, we post, like, we have to asterisk out every. I know. <laughs> the fact that, like, you're able, the fact that your app got accepted onto the App Store, <laughs> like, I was just, because I'm an app developer, I've built so many apps, and, like, the process of just, I, I made an app called yeah. Boomoji once, Boomoji. And, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, and I just wanted to do, like, little, like, doodled boobs. Like, you know, like, little, like, just, like, a W with two dots, you know? Right. Like, doodled boobs. And it just it did not get accepted. Nothing I did worked. I had to be, like, breast ah. cancer awareness. Just, like, <laughs> ribbons. It ended up being just ribbons, you know? Like, pink ribbons. Because so I don't know how you made that work. That's, like, very impressive. Yeah, well, a lot of it, like you're saying, is is the branding of it. Which yeah. was another thing I didn't understand when I first started Quinn was, like, mm -hmm. the level of that how much language matters when mm -hmm. you're talking about something. Like, at first I was like, you know what, fuck it. Like, I'm going to call it porn. I'm going to call it this. Like, this is yeah. a revolution, blah, blah, blah. And that's definitely, that resonates for our audience. Right. But when I'm dealing with, like, stakeholders like Apple, Stripe, Google Play, whatever, it's like right. you have to sort of package it cute, make it nice, make it Whitney Wolf-esque, you know what I mean, and make totally. it, keep it tight. But no, I mean, no shade to Whitney Wolf. She's literally everything. But um I think it's like you have to modulate what story you're telling based on who you're talking to, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Totally. Totally, <laughs> yeah. And then, so, like, how did you, like, get... It, was it because of your experience in senior year of you having like this dysfunction because of like everything that was going on that you mm -hmm. then felt motivated to create a product that actually like helps women orgasm or like were you always just super sex positive and then just it made sense for you to do something like that or like how did that happen? In that Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I don't I wouldn't consider myself 
like a sex positive person or particularly kinky or um, out there. It's definitely become part of my personal brand as of late. But I think, um, yeah, no, when I started it, it was really based on finding audio erotica. So like, okay. To, oh wow! Yeah, so like once I found it and like it really worked for me, I I like shared it with some of my friends in Theta, mm-hmm. and all of them loved it. And I made like a Tumblr blog for us. I forget what it was called. It was called something funny, and we like everyone was sharing it. Yeah. And then I yeah, it was just all these different factors coming together because it was like right. I was I wanted to find something I was passionate about yeah. going forward. Mm. And yeah, I just started working on it more than school. Wow. And I was like, you know what? There's an idea definitely in Stanford that you can start your own thing, right? right. So that. Was was kind of I was in that headspace mm-hmm. when I started yeah got it so it's kind of just like you identified a problem right and then you you found a solution and you kind of just went for it so it wasn't really about the industry no. or like who you are or just anything like that <laughs> it was more like the entrepreneurial inside of you that's like oh this is like something that I, I can create real impact with I guess Right, and there are all these like proof points for this type of content, right? Like Fifty Shades of Grey, and like book talk, and mm-hmm. smut talk, and and mm-hmm. and women really liking, you know, different types of erotic content than men, and fan fiction, and all this stuff, and Tumblr porn, and Reddit porn, and all this stuff. But there's never been a mainstream product that you know serves this need for women, and so that was kind of it, definitely from like a business perspective, that's what appealed to me the most. Mm-hmm. And then obviously, I felt personally attached to the mission. Right. Yeah. And I guess what you were saying that like you didn't like for out of the bedroom things like there's a lot of like doctors and ways of getting help and things like that but for women in the bedroom is just it's that isn't there and that's why like for my podcast the slogan is literally fake it till you make it not faking orgasms yes. because as a woman we need to feel empowered in all aspects of our lives mm-hmm. you know and it's not that conversation of in the bedroom empowerment just isn't talked about as much and I literally it's like very clear that a lot of the times what happens in the bedroom translates out of it what happens out of the bedroom room translates inside of it and so like it's so important to just talk about all of that and not exclude it because it's kind of risque or you know absolutely I always talk about the cognitive dissonance at Stanford of like you're in a classroom and you're really encouraged to speak your mind and like participate on and and you don't think as much about like the gender difference right like in the classroom or in clubs or whatever and then you go to a frat party and it's a totally different dynamic Mm. and it's like you're kind of like what the fuck like yeah like who am I and and who am I in society who am I what is my value you know like if you're if you're kind of oscillating there's a great quote that's like women live in the space between like person and object Mm. right and it's kind of like we're asked to switch so much from like yes I'm a full person to like no I'm just here to like attract men or whatever Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and I think that's especially in educational environments that's really and I guess also work environments but there's something about college yeah where you're like partying and you're in school yeah you know and I think at Stanford the reason why it's so like apparent there is because like I I went there too and I remember just thinking just these smart fucking women <laughs> geniuses <laughs> so smart like in the classroom they're just like comparing <laughs> topics I like how did you find that connection you know just like real genuine intelligence <laughs> that like when I'm in the classroom I'm just like wow you're so fucking smart like right. this is crazy and then and then you go into the dorm room and you start talking about boys mm-hmm. and it's just like why do you let these guys do this to you why is sex so terrible for you mm-hmm. why don't you speak up why don't you like this like all of these things and I genuinely am just confused yes. as to like why this dynamic exists you know Absolutely. And it, it's almost like so shocking that you don't really realize it when you're in it. Yeah. But and, 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 and women are so adept at switching their mode when they're talking to a man that they, they're interested in or want. Right. And I do think the whole idea of casual sex, I was talking about this on TikTok, was that like yes. the casual sex is sort of or sex positivity without criticism, without nuance, actually just really just serves men. Mm-hmm. Because like when have you left? Like I just saw so many blackout hookups in college that left women in distress, straight right. up like in distress the next morning. But we're all being fed or drinking this Kool-Aid of like, you know, be sexually free, be liberated, mm-hmm. be empowered. Mm-hmm. What it, what sex actually empowers you? And that's a personal question, you know? Right. It might be that getting super drunk and like having sex with someone random does feel genuinely empowering and liberating to you. But I don't think that we should accept that at face value. Mm -hmm. We should sort of like poke it. Okay, what kind of sex 
makes me feel like you're saying like a full person right. is in line with my values yeah you know mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that yeah so it's kind of like not just like empowerment or sexual empowerment as we hear it it's kind of like it's okay to have a lot of sex right you know but something that we should be talking about more is that we should not just like base it on numbers and just having a lot of sex but it's based on quality sex yes. and <laughs> having a lot of good sex you know yes. that's what really we should be focused on that's what real empowerment is like orgasming coming having right. actual <laughs> pleasure not not just not being in pain you know because that's been like a metric literally a metric from my friend group of oh it didn't hurt so it wasn't so bad you know and just like it's so crazy that that's the baseline yes of good sex absolutely yeah yeah you're, you're so right and I think like I yeah I think this idea of like um more like more and counting and Mm -hmm. performing and it's all part of the same problem that we have you know with like porn and sex and everything it's like it's very it's just performative and it's Mm -hmm. like it it, it's like you know the idea of bases the idea Mm -hmm. of like all this stuff is designed to like make us feel worse and like kind of ultimately only serves men and a lot of men actually aren't don't feel served by it you know a lot of men don't actually want to have a lot of casual sex and they also feel a lot of pressure Mm. and they also want to be you know having amazing sex and better sex and learning yeah and it's like no one's being no one's being served here you know by this whole system so yeah yeah. what have you learned about like the orgasm gap like what do you want to explain a little bit of what that even is and Yes. So I think, you know what, I have to look up the stat on my phone, but I think it's something like 20% of women report orgasming the last time they had sex compared to like 80% of men or 75% of men. Okay. Um, So, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's sad. (laughs) But something like, I don't know, 70% of women orgasm every time they masturbate. So it's not necessarily that... um, like women don't have orgasms, period, and right. lesbian sex has a much higher rate of orgasm. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> um, it's been yeah. better. I think I'm bisexual, and like oh, I you want, are. I didn't know that. yeah, and I like want like like straight sex, and I have to be as good as queer sex. But like it's just <laughs> like I want that so badly, just because like I want you know like I want to like it more. I, I'm attracted to men, you know, but it's just consistently like girls are just better kissers. Like they just yeah, they've just been better. No, everyone always on TikTok is like, I just like why do I like men? No offense. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but it's yeah, it's definitely, you know, I, I think it's just like and it's it's not the fault of anyone living currently today. And I want to make that clear. It's like yeah. the fault of systems that have yeah, been in place systematic. forever. 100%. And like and Esther Perel says, like the sex reflects the, the major problems in society. Like you can look to sex to see how women are treated in society to mm-hmm. see how, uh, you know, how children are treated, like that sex is a microcosm of culture at large, of mm-hmm. society at large. Mm-hmm. And I think that's absolutely true with totally. like how, you know, women feel in sex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then what about like porn? Let's like get into porn a little <laughs> okay. bit. So yeah. this has been, so you clearly don't, aren't a fan of it maybe because <laughs> because your your app is audio porn. So I guess there's different right. kinds of porn. Right. Yeah. This is it's the nuanced. thing. It's, it's nuanced because people yeah. say like, like I, I'm, I am not um, pro certain types of visual porn. Okay. I'm certainly pro ethical creator driven yeah. like like for example a lot of the creators on Quinn also have only fans where they make visual content and i want to be it. clear that i well, i think of that in a totally different box in my mind um like independent creators versus like studios and managers in this sort of old model of porn that really disenfranchised particularly young female porn stars okay um or just porn actresses like the life cycle of a porn star in like you know like 2000 through 2020 is like mm-hmm. three months. Wow. So it's like they really, they'll post a, a posting online or, or DM someone, right? Like move them to a group. Like this is, I mean, this you should watch the, um, documentary hot girls wanted it's about this kind of flow of the porn system but um, it's on netflix right yes yeah yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. and i mean it's certainly not reflective again of like the entire porn industry right but any and every single person i've met who makes visual porn acknowledges these problems you know what i mean i don't think like performers are upset when like a lot of things in the porn industry but i don't think 
and a lot of people criticizing the porn industry, but I don't think they would any of them would ever say that like the porn industry is without problems mm-hmm. because it's a very unregulated um, kind of black hole, and, um, and and there's just a lot of there's just a lot of problems, mm-hmm. um, and then there's like questions of generally what can a person separately, what can a person consent to? Mm. So like, you know, and people talk about a lot, talk about this a lot in sex discourse generally, which is like, there's been so much um, placed on this idea of consent. So like, Mm. um, but is yes enough? Mm -hmm. And what does yes mean in different contexts? So like, if you're being coerced into doing something and you say yes, you say it's okay. Um, but you know you're being coer- coerced, right. or you know, can you consent to someone say like eating you alive? Like, no, you can't consent to that, right? right. And so th- there's like all sorts of mm. like tough like ethical questions around people's like the power imbalances in society and totally. what consent means, and yeah. and I don't think it's it's certainly a good place to start is with right. like basic consent, but I don't think it captures the whole picture. Um, yeah. No, I think Almost. because no, no, yeah, I think because porn is like somewhat unregulated for mm-hmm. the most part. You know, it's like not. Is it technically legal to be a porn star? Yes, it yep. is. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're allowed to record like pornography and you're allowed to post it online. Correct. That's legal. That's legal. Okay, mm-hmm. but then regulation around these things is it? Would you say good for the most part? Like, are women protected in these industries or not really? Right. So I think the important thing is like we don't want punitive regulation. We want regulation that protects performers. Right. And Often when people like often legislators will make protect like they'll say, oh, this is a, this protects sex workers. But it's really to kind of go after the sex work. Okay. Got it. Um, so we would really like ideally what I think would be healthy for the ecosystem yeah. would be to have genuine like protections of sex workers. Totally. Make, you know, and and OnlyFans has truly just completely changed you know, yeah. what it means to be a sex worker and who can be a sex worker and yeah. the safety of sex workers. Right. Um, and I, yeah, I think like going sure. back to the consent thing, it's like, I read a great article. Very few people do porn because it's like what they say, it, it, like, it's not like their passion, right? Mm. Um, they do it because it makes amazing money or right. it makes good money for them right. in comparison to other opportunities. Like, opportunities. Right. So like instead of being, and put yourself in this situation. Like, if you have a young kid or a, or a family you're taking care of, right. you can choose to be a bartender, right? Work late nights, right. Um, you know, per, perhaps like expose yourself to physical violence and right. all sorts of things. Or you can make erotic content from the comfort of your home. Right. So, like, that's an easy choice. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah totally. Um, and I think that's where, like, the questions of um, consent come in because it's like, we're seeing that the same type of person is making erotic content, young women. Um, and like, so their opportunities are very limited mm-hmm. economically in America. And so that's something we should look at. But I don't think it's like, yeah, right. you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so what you're saying, <laughs> yeah. from what I'm understanding, yeah. is that some people go into this industry not out of because they love having sex or having 17 dicks in their face, <laughs> but it's more just because it's a good way to make money. Yeah. And so yeah. they do it. And so they consent to it, not out of like real choice, but out of kind of this like pressure they feel to have to support themselves or somebody else. And that's why they're there, you know? Really well um, said. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's like kind of a way to, of thinking about the porn industry. And then also I think another aspect to it too is like at least for Pornhub, uh, just not knowing when it's consent or not you know yes. like the yeah. fact that it's kind of a YouTube of porn right. allows anybody to upload anything and there's just so many articles of just like 15 year olds that were raped that it just went on to Pornhub right. you know and then it took like the 15 year old's family just so many months to get that video down and also you can download videos on Pornhub and then like it just lives on forever at that point you know and so just that aspect right. of things too and even in like the like if you think about how Euphoria say on HBO like how they think about sex scenes right they have intimacy coordinators. They have obviously the director, the director of photography, the, you know, all these different people involved mm-hmm. in making this sex scene and and talking about what they want the audience to take away from it or what kind of sex they want to model, right? Or interesting. Because they acknowledge, right, like in entertainment, oh, people are gonna uh, we have influence, you know, whether we like it or not, right? We're a source of education, right? right? Um, we're a source of like what's cool. Mm-hmm. And and so it's like important. Um to make like decisions that, you know, um, yeah, to make, just to make conscious, like intentional decisions. Mm -hmm. But since there's not like, 
um, there aren't like those forces at play on on these sites like Pornhub, and you don't even get mm-hmm. to see like I don't think obviously there's we have lots of content on Quinn that involve that involves like degradation mm-hmm. or you know rough sex those sorts of things, but it's really important to like uh, frame that conversation mm-hmm. in a way that's like you know oh this is how people talk about um, having sex like that and how do we make sure that everyone feels like good after or whatever. Mm. Um, Oh, so you're saying in the audio porn itself, it's very conversational. So it's mm-hmm. like, so because I, I listened to some of it. Mm-hmm. I listened to some of it today, actually. Oh, good. Yeah, and I was like, this is actually turning me on. <laughs> like, this is awesome, you know? But for good. me, I was more like listening to like friend, lover right, stuff. Like right, to right, me, right. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is like for me, like this is what I want to listen to. Um, I The rough stuff, not for me. So I haven't <laughs> listened to that. But so yeah. I'm just like, here. so is it in the audio porn, is it like kind of, just more healthy a more healthy Mm. portrayal of what like rough sex is or like right well yeah there's a lot and I actually don't think it's like I don't think it makes it clinical I don't think it makes it not hot I think it makes it hotter to hear the part of the conversation where they're like oh you want to explore this you want to try this like what like what are your limits and then the idea of aftercare of like snuggling and being like you know I don't actually think like you know even though I say X, Y, or Z while we're having sex, this is how I really feel about you, right? right. That was like a role play. Yeah. Because those lines can get blurry um, whether you want them to or not. Mm-hmm. Um, totally. Yeah, and so I think just like under, like just learning that framing because it's really, imagine being a 16-year-old kid and your first exposure to, or your first, like seeing someone have sex for the first time, you see, you know, a racially charged, um, uh, like, uh, really kind of fet- like a fetishization of sex mm-hmm. that's like so you know like the titles on Pornhub mm-hmm. I'm thinking of of like tiny tit yeah s- tiny tit small girl Asian milf whatever yeah. and it's like that's not like that's not how we should think about other people yeah. and that's not how we we don't like on any other media platform right that would be a problem yeah. that would be like them using their platform in a negative way I know the fact that <laughs> yeah. it's not ra- like racist on these right. platforms the right. fact that like we accept that it's okay to say like black on black like Asian this like you know Mm -hmm. is crazy for the most part right and I understand that like the pushback to that might be like oh um people are attracted to certain races and certain physical attributes and whatever I think that's okay I I just think there's like a respectful way to talk about it Mm -hmm. um because what happens is like when you start fetishizing traits about people like that like Mm. small people people who look young people who are yeah Asian or black or 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 large or small or whatever it starts to create this like objectification of those types of people in our society yeah right which Mm -hmm. we've seen obviously like in in life (laughs) no no I I read some research like prior to like coming here to talk to you just to learn about how porn is affecting people Mm -hmm. because like it does, you know, for the most part. And something that I've noticed too is that a lot of my friends and also like my younger friends who are like between the ages of like 18, you know, that I somehow became friends with, they're all into very rough sex. They're all into like really like, if it's painful, it's actually like pleasurable. And Mm. I'm like, if that's you, that's fine. But I am just seeing a trend where like my friends who are 30 or just like older, they're not Mm. as into rough sex as my friends who are a lot younger. Mm. And I just think it's so interesting and a lot I ask them actually do you watch porn just like as my own little study and the older ones don't watch it as much the younger ones watch it all the time they grew up watching porn they grew up watching it yeah Yeah. and so I think that there is a correlation between just like watching this like violent sex and then how like you envision yourself having sex too um, and what you find pleasure based on like what porn showing you is pleasurable Um, well 80% of visual porn features violence against women yeah and 80% of sex in real life you know doesn't Mm -hmm. right Right? And like that's not an accurate, I think, representation of what people want and, totally. and do. And like, you know, most of the time when you're having sex with someone, you love them right. or like you care about them in some way. Right. Um, so it just feels, yeah, it feels like something's amiss. It feels not reflective of like what we actually want and, and need. Yeah. Totally. And so is that kind of how like Quinn came into existence? You're kind of trying to just create this like porn that actually has these intimate conversations and is like showing what real sex looks like or like what? Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think it's like, like, yes, Quinn is quote unquote, like, 
you know, better for you or whatever. Right. But it's also, I think, hotter mm. because there's amazing like plots and stories and you feel closer to someone. You feel like you're in bed with someone. Right. Um, so I think it's both like when we compare it to food, I say it's, it's healthier, but also tastes better. It's right. like it feels really good and I hear all the time from people that like when they finish watching porn they'll like snap their computer clothes and feel really mm. guilty and feel that like kind of shameful feeling and with Quinn it, I think people don't experience that because that's interesting they're not watching anything right and they're honestly like drawing on their own experiences yeah drawing on people they have crushes on or sexual experiences right. they've had or mm. you know like thinking about just using their imagination. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And I think it's really cool. And that definitely like helps with closing the orgasm gap a little bit too, because it is kind of somewhat empowering to like have that audio experience in itself. If you're not comparing yourself to like what's happening on the screen or what right. sex is supposed to look like, you're kind of just envisioning what you want it to look like in your own head. Um, yes. which is really cool. I yeah, exactly. Mm. <laughs> So is there any like stigmas that you face like working in this industry or I don't know, has anybody ever like been like, this is bad what you're doing or like, how has how has that been? I, absolutely, definitely. Yeah. Um, but I like, it's been so unpredictable. Mm. So it's like people I think will be super receptive to Quinn sometimes yeah. aren't and are like, you know, maybe carry more shame around porn and stuff like that. And then some people, you know, older men actually are very receptive to Quinn, older wow. white men. Yeah. <laughs> I Like I have several amazing advisors, investors who are like sort of this typical older white male investor. Yeah. Um, but I think it's because. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, from them, it's been a thing of like, I want my daughter, I want my wife, my sister to have like a really empowering relationship with sex. Right. They love women. And yeah. and they also, you know, feel that porn doesn't serve men either. Mm, right. Totally. And so uh, that's been just an interesting like thing for me to have men be really supportive of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think I think like in when you're more nuanced about sex too, it like like you're saying it, it is tastier because you're actually <laughs> saying what you want, you know, like it does translate more into that and when you actually say what you want in sex and when you're actually like open and vulnerable, then it is just better sex because you're actually feeling good and that's like what it comes down to, right? Like the quality versus the the quantity, I yes. guess. Um, yeah, exactly. So Yeah. That's totally really cool. <laughs> Is there any like resources or anything that you'd want to share with people um, uh, to feel more empowered sexually or anything? Ooh, yeah. Okay, so a few books um come as you are by emily nagoski is yes. really good okay, you're the second person to come onto my podcast and recommend <laughs> that book it's really good that's yeah, awesome yeah, yeah. And then, i read it so oh you did, I did oh good it. And okay. i did i like had a hard time orgasming i orgasmed for the first time a year ago oh my god yeah. Mazel. Thank, you. thank you so much yeah it was a great day i like said i sent a voice message to my mom i like i sent like i was like telling people like i orgasmed yeah. <laughs> like called my yeah. friends, you know? <laughs> well, often really smart, accomplished type A women have more trouble or overthinkers generally have more trouble. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's very psychological. Yes. Which is like yeah. annoying because then you have to like, it's hard to undo that in your own head. You yeah. Know? <laughs> so I totally, unfortunately understand. <laughs> broke the curse. <laughs> I broke the curse. I got a sex therapist that helped. Oh, no way. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Yeah. Is she going to come on the pod? She was on the podcast earlier today. <laughs> she was my, so today has been a sex themed day oh, for got me, it. a okay. podcast. <laughs> so yeah, that's been, it's been really fun. It's all like fresh on my mind, everything, which is nice, you know. And I'm trying to think, oh, well, I love Esther Perel. Anything, I just feel she's very honest. Honest. Okay. Even when it's not, um, when even when it's controversial, she like okay. who so is that? She wrote "Mating in Captivity." Okay, and it's about this idea that in relationships we need safety, but we also need mystery and mm. danger. Okay, and like my favorite thing she says is that when there's nothing left to hide, there's nothing left to seek, mm. which is about this idea of like retaining your identity in a relationship. And during the pandemic, obviously, so many couples they're living with each other, they're doing everything with each other, and there's no mystery, there's no like allure, which is where like desire really flourishes when you don't know, right. you know, and, totally. And you're flirting a little bit. So mm. she, writes, she has a great book on that. Um, and then Ian Kerner, all of his books, really good. So those cool. are like my fave sex therapists. Awesome. <laughs> and then the last question I ask everybody okay. is, how have you faked it? 
Oh, <laughs> everything. <laughs> like, tell me, tell, what's something that sticks out to okay, you? Okay, so I mean, something that people always ask me is like, well, how did you learn how to run a company or whatever? Yeah. And I just Google it. Mm. That's literally, I just Google everything. Yes. Like, there's so many resources out there. That's my big, like, you know, tip is like, okay, you know, what kind of taxes does a startup file? Right. I Googled it. And, yeah. and like learned about it, watched YouTube, right? Yeah. Um, or, you know, how do you raise money? How do you pitch an investor? Yes. Like, I think, I mean, obviously you go to your friends, go to your, like, go to people you trust to um, ask questions, but the internet is your friend. Totally. <laughs> I totally agree. And like learning how to Google is even a skill with, like yes. within oh, itself. Well said. Like, yes. like, you know, like you can like search like from like this time period and like there's certain ways to really, like you can search certain file extensions. Like there's so many little tricks and nannies and well, things like that. Yeah, people don't know if you put quotes, it looks for that exact phrase. Which yeah. is, that's a bit, that's an intro tip, but it really will save you a lot of time. <laughs> totally, yeah. And I totally agree. Like I have this whole like thing that I talk about how um, using all you need is two things to learn anything uh, the computer and a mindset that's like my two things because yes. the internet you can learn literally anything on the internet if you want to be a lawyer like you can probably make it work you can find some <laughs> online law firm I don't you can do it you, Dude, the you internet can do it. is like just start making TikToks that's another thing mm. oh sorry but like the reach on TikTok is insane right now and maybe mm. YouTube reels too but it's like a renaissance of people getting famous so mm. you know. have you been doing that with Quinn a lot or? yeah oh, yeah cool. we make a lot of TikToks but it's it's like as a startup right you're constantly trying to find ways to tell people about your, right. your product without having to spend a lot of money yeah and so like for products I'm like just go on and talk about how you made what you made yeah. why you like it what your journey talk about anything really right. eventually totally. it'll go viral and then it'll, it'll be amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you need you need the internet and another thing is a mindset mindset to be like I can do this you know because if you don't have that mindset of like I can just learn off the internet you won't be able to learn off the internet so great advice I, I'm gonna use that that's amazing use it <laughs> <laughs> awesome well thank you so much for coming thank on thank you for this having really me amazing. thank you so much and and yeah best of luck with the pod thanks <laughs>